Hey everybody, it's a great delight to be with you for the 2020 Diamond Awards, a very special event and a very important event in a year that, let's face it, we are never going to forget. And it's fair to say that during this period, a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of teams are feeling as though they've lost their mojo. They're feeling a little uncertain, a bit vanilla. They're not really sure what's going to happen. And there has to be a tipping point. There has to be a moment where we start to think about what does the future look like for us? And this was a comment that was made to me by Dr. Terry Walls. And Dr. Walls wrote a book called The Walls Protocol, which was about how she cured herself from degenerative multiple sclerosis. If I take you back, in medical school, Dr. Walls started getting these, she said it was like a hot dagger or a cattle prod in her face on a regular basis. And it's hurt a lot. And she went to see her peers who started giving her medication and traditional cures. And after a while, they diagnosed this degenerative multiple sclerosis and they started giving her treatments for MS. But being degenerative, it means it got worse and worse. And it did. And as she left medical school and started to practice, it got so bad she ended up in a wheelchair. And traditional the common approach to how they would deal with multiple sclerosis and in a degenerative fashion. When they started working with it, it didn't work. And so her multiple sclerosis got worse and worse. She ended up in a wheelchair. And then she took matters into her own hands and she started to experiment with her food and she started to eat differently and she started to meditate and do mindfulness. And there came a day where she said, I think I could walk and she grabbed a walking stick and she started to slowly but surely teach herself how to walk again. Then one day she went to her wife Jackie and said, you know, I haven't ridden my bike in four or five years. I'd like to ride my bike again. So they got onto her son, Zach. Zach went to the shed, grabbed the bike, brought it out, cleaned it up. She said, I jumped on my bike and I only went one block around the house and came back, but I'd done it. I hadn't done it in years and it felt so good. I said, when you went to your wife, Jackie, who's been with you for this whole journey, I said, what do you remember? She said, Gary, I remembered that I went from living day to day to living with a future vision. And her vision is to create an epidemic of health, which is why she's written this book called The Walls Protocol. An amazing lady. This conversation happened during the pandemic and it made me think about this, this period, this COVID-19 period. That yes, a lot of us have had to survive this period, keep our companies afloat, keep our teams motivated, just get through day to day in isolation. There has to come a day at tipping point where we start to have a vision for the future. What does it look like for you in the future? What does it look like for your team in the future? What does it look like for your company in the future? And people are crying out for people who can see what the future looks like. The tipping point is going from just surviving into now we're going to start to thrive. There's an interesting science behind this, and this is Preetha G. Preetha G runs, she said to be one of the great female philosophers of the world. And she runs an academy in India called the O&O Academy with her husband, Krishna G. We spoke just last week and I said, what are you noticing about people business leaders in today's world, Prithiji. She said, Gary, during this pandemic, people are living in a state of doing. They're not in a state of being. They're doing work, but they're not being present. They're doing conversations, but they're not being present in the conversations. They're doing leadership, but they're not being great leaders. We're doing partnerships, but are we being great partners? And this made me think about the fact that once we, once we consider this a tipping point, we need to start considering what does the future look like for you personally, for your community group, for your team, for the company, for your category? At what point do we tip, tip over to go from day to day into having a vision for the future where we are in meetings with our team and we are actually present in that meeting? We're actually thinking through problems. So when we have supply chain interruption, we go from just the doing part of doing things into the being part of being a great strategist. 
And I saw this quote recently in a book. It was a book about Zen. And it said, as long as the mind is moving, it is unable to accurately reflect the various aspects of the external world, the doing. Just as a warped mirror cannot reflect objects as they really are. Accordingly, we cannot expect clear judgment from an agitated mind. See, one of the issues when people lose their mojo is they live with this agitated mind because they're too busy doing stuff to try and get themselves free from this. They're not actually being present with themselves, listening to their inner voice, listening to others, showing appreciation, acknowledging other people, acknowledging themselves. And if you feel as though you're in this state of having an agitated mind, what you've got to think about each day and almost do an audit on yourself to say, what am I thinking about? And what am I focused on? And am I focused on the right things? Because right now, during this challenging period of the pandemic that we've had for the last six to eight months, people have been focused on a lot of things that aren't going to physically or emotionally help them personally. We get caught up in, we get distracted by what other people think we should be thinking about as opposed to, are we focused on the right things? And this creates an agitated mind. If there was something I could help you with in order to start to work out your own personal mojo and the mojo for you as a leader or a contributor to your organization, you might want to think about breaking down your world to say, what really is important for me? If my mojo was working perfectly, what things would I be doing in a perfect day, a perfect week, a perfect month? And draw yourself a little wagon wheel. Now, here's one I prepared earlier. In the wheel, you may have things like, let's say, family. Critically important for most people. Health. Without it, nothing's going to matter. A bit of F-U-N, a bit of fun. Uh, work. Friends. Community, perhaps. This is just a wheel to give you an idea and an example of what you might put into yours. This is your own personal wheel. How many spokes you have is entirely up to you. When we lose our mojo, whether it be because of the pandemic, the period of the pandemic, or some external or internal factor, you can be guaranteed that these things go out of whack. This is not a time allocation. This is a focus allocation. Draw yourself a wagon wheel. And the night before each day, think about the one thing you'll do for family tomorrow to make it a great day. Think about the most important one thing you do for your own health or wellness. What's the one thing you want to do for fun tomorrow? It's on a time allocation. It's a focus allocation and putting these things into your day. When we don't have these things working and how many you have in here is entirely up to you. You probably wouldn't have any more than this. You'd probably want to have less in fact. The most important things for the perfect day or perfect week or perfect month. Now, I've become a bit of a fan of the TV show called Yellowstone. I've only just discovered it on fan and I am ripping through it now. But the father of the ranch in Montana, it's a cowboy, it's a cowboy series and it's very, very popular. But John Dutton says to his son, Jamie, his granddad taught him a lesson. You can't fix a broken wagon wheel but you can use the pieces to build a new one. If things are out of whack with your wagon wheel, it's fine. Because the pandemic has changed the world. Things are going to be different. It's the mind that can adapt that's going to thrive. The tipping point is appreciating the fact that things are going to change and we're going to adapt. You may not have your wagon wheel exactly the same as it was in January or December last year, but what you've got to do is use the pieces that are broken to build a brand new wagon wheel, to work out what are the areas in your life that are the most important things and focus on them. The British rowing team had a saying that when someone brought something to their training room or brought something to their meetings, the first question they'd ask is, will this make the boat go faster? You've got to think about your day in and out of work when there are things that are likely to distract you, take you away from your wagon wheel, Think to yourself, will this make the boat go faster? Will this help me achieve my dreams? Will this help me achieve my mission? Will this help get my new wagon wheel to roll efficiently? And control the controllables. If there are things you cannot control, 
in the day, then you're gonna think about taking them out of your day. Because people who lose their mojo haven't found the tipping point. They're not really sure what a compelling future looks like. They certainly haven't done a wagon wheel to break down what are the important elements in my day or my week that are, that are important to me to be in there. But if I do that, that will give me a compelling future and one that I feel fulfilled with. But we tend to focus on things that we can't control. Take them out of the equation and work on things that are important to you. And one way to do that is to build rituals. Morning, lunchtime, evening. And a lot of people are talking about rituals because the nice thing about rituals is rituals are a prescribed set of actions that you do in a set order to give you the outcome you require. If you take your wagon wheel, you can take many of those things and put them into a ritual, become ritualized or routines. Wake up in the morning, after you've done your toiletries, you may have a cup of coffee and do some gratitude. You may do some stretching or yoga. Take the dog for a walk. Watch the sun come up. Do mindfulness. Read a book. Do a lot of writing, journaling. Things that are important to you as part of your world and your wagon wheel. Set them up in an order in the morning. Because the nice thing about rituals is it's a set prescribed list of things you'll do that help you focus on what's important straight up in the morning. The other nice thing about rituals is it helps you get away from the things you don't want to happen. So the things you don't want in your day that are distracting you, things you can't control, take them out. Ritualization, there's a lot being written and talked about this, is a powerful way for you to increase your productivity, your performance, and to feel good about yourself because chances are by six, seven o'clock in the morning, you've done a lot of what's important. And one of those things has to be learning. And taking the learnings and working out how will you remember them. Curating your learnings is an important part of what you do as a leader, as a productive member of the community. And it's also really good for your spirit, for your mojo to be learning new things. Now, this can be done today with books, can be done with audio books. So part of it could be kill two birds, two birds with one stone. Get a great audio book or a podcast and go for a walk. Moving is something they've been doing for generations. Generations and generations. Great philosophers used to walk. Steve Jobs would have his meetings walking around the campus at Cupertino. Michelangelo, these guys are all ceaseless wanderers. Cal Newport, who wrote the wonderful book, Deep Work, does all his deep thinking while he's walking through the woods. So think about where, where in your day, as part of your wagon wheel, is movement, because that helps you get your mojo working. There's a point between what happens and how you respond. And Viktor Frankl wrote about this in Man's Search for Meaning. He talked about the space between the stimulus and the response. So there might be a reduction in pharmacy foot traffic. Great, that's what's happened. The beauty is that little space before you react to go, huh, this is where being a great strategist, being a great leader is so important in that space in that you're sitting in a meeting with somebody, giving them full attention, phone bings, immediately your attention's gone. That's the stimulus. Your choice then is how you respond. If you're a parent sitting at the dinner table and that phone bings, there's a space between the stimulus and the response. Think carefully about that space because that's the difference between the doing and the being. Doing it and being it. And in that space, there's a lot of discussion about reflection and gratitude and dreaming. And that's all the stuff you do between the space between the stimulus and the response. One last thing I'm going to leave with you, and this is probably the most important thing of dealing with the pandemic is, how do you see yourself in the face of discomfort and hardship? And there was saying by Martin Luther King who said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he is stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. It's not, measuring a man is not in the comfort and convenience. It's where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And I heard Barack Obama say that all growth comes from discomfort. Identity is such an important topic today. Because if you see yourself as a person who embraces discomfort, if you see yourself as the type of person 
that when things go pear-shaped and it is uncomfortable, people know they can come to you. If you have the identity of a person who embraces discomfort, you will change your own identity and the impact you can have on your family, your community, your team, the company, your category, your industry. Resilience is when something happens and you back up. Grit is when you do that over and over and over and over. To have an identity as a gritty person is such an important part of this because in order to change the habits that follow that, the space between stimulus and response, the doing and the being, all the things we've talked about. If you see yourself as a person who can handle discomfort, who has a resilient person, who is a gritty person, whatever that identity looks like, that is an important part. If we can teach our children to see themselves as somebody who can embrace discomfort, they will write their own ticket in whatever they want to do. And the classic example is where you see somewhere there's an escalator and a set of stairs. The escalators are packed, but the set of stairs will be empty. But the person who takes the stairs is saying to themselves, I'm the person who seeks to do something above and beyond the rest of the pack. I'm the person who doesn't want to see themselves as the herd. I'm the person who seeks discomfort. I'm the person who looks to exercise wherever I see possible. How you see yourself as your identity is such an important part of performance. And this is one of the greatest leadership tools I can give you. That during the pandemic, the people that stood up are the people who went, I'm the sort of person who can handle this. This is David Petrino. Now, David Petrino runs the Impossible Laboratory and he won the Australian of the Year globally. He invented what they call a $25 eye writer. And it's something that completely paralyzed people can use to communicate and run a computer simply using their eyes. It's insane. And I said, how do, how do you, what's your, how do you see yourself? When you're taking on challenges like this, how do you see yourself? And he said to me, quote unquote, I chase hard things. I see myself as the sort of person who chases hard things. Don't you want that guy in your corner when you are faced with supply chain interruptions? Don't you want a guy to say, man, I got a problem. And he's going, well, I'm the person who chases hard things. What do you got for me? Let's, let's bring it on. Your identity, how you see yourself informs all the habits that follow. How you approach your day, how you approach meetings, how you approach your rituals and routines. And that was written up in this book by James Clear, a fantastic book called Atomic Habits. This is a great read for any leader because we try and change our habits, but we don't change the identity that sits in front of it. Intelligence is the ability to be able to adapt to change. Things have been changed. And what we need to understand is if we see ourselves, our identity as a person who can adapt to change, you will change the world in everything you do. However, if you fight for your limitations, I promise you they will be yours. I spoke with a behavioural scientist recently called Dr. Demartini, John Demartini. He was in a movie called The Secret, a very popular book some time back. He told me the most important question that Bill Gates asked himself every morning. He said, with the resources I have now, how can I serve the most amount of people in a way that inspires me? So tomorrow morning when you wake up, ask yourself that question. With the resources you have available, how can I serve the most people in a way that inspires you? And just pick out one single thing. Heathrow, Dallas Airport, used to be, used to be very busy airports. They will be once again. Imagine an airport, the biggest airports in the world. Hundreds of thousands of planes land every day. They can only land one aircraft at a time. So take something we've talked about during this awards event. Take one thing and execute. Just land one single plane and I promise you it will make a massive difference. If you would like a copy of the slides I've presented for this event, you'll be able to find them at garybertwistle.com forward slash mojo chp and the password will be mojo1. 
A lot of the conversations that I've talked about today, you'll find on my podcast called The Mojo Sessions on all your favorite platforms. Enjoy the event, enjoy the awards. It's very special, it's so important, and I think the work you guys do is so noble. And it's been an absolute privilege being with you for this event. And I hope somewhere down the windy road, I get to see you again. Thanks, guys.